Can you give me some uh, examples of DeFi 4.0? Absolutely. Like, so for example, Uniswap, you know, the network, you know, with the Uni token, uh, Aave, the network, you know, also with the Aave uh, token, you know, governance token, you know, a lot of folks, you know, can own the governance token in their own wallet. At the same time, you know, they can use it in the network. You know, those are the two primary examples. And just follow, okay, uh, DeFi 2.0 then. How is that different from DeFi 1.0? Right, it's a deep topic, you know. Uh, I guess, you know, one way to put it is that, you know, in DeFi 1.0, a lot of the tokens, a lot of the protocols, you know, look for ways, you know, to attract community users, you know, to find use cases on the network, you know. Uh, one of the things that they do is by doing staking, you know. And uh, if I were to water it down a, a little bit, you can think of it as uh, in the existing financial systems, uh, how, uh, you know, in the monetary systems, you know, a lot of currencies, you know, would uh, print money, so similar to US dollars, you know, similar to, let's say, Bank of Japan, Bank of China, Bank of England, you know, uh, they will continue to print money to increase the circulating supply. Uh, and at the same time, you know, uh, think of it at another angle, it actually creates inflation. At the same time, if you were to think of it in another perspective, it also means that the money in your account uh, remains the same while the circulating supply keeps on increasing, meaning the share that you own from a supply perspective, you know, uh, reducing. Uh, and if you were to think of it that way, a lot of the protocols are trying to mimic the exact same dynamics at the same time trying to, you know, give people an idea that, you know, you're not losing your share. You're basically being rewarded by staking, you know, the tokens onto the network. Uh, at the same time, you know, uh, th this is how we define yield. This is how we define, you know, the, the fact that, you know, you're, you're rewarded, you know, for using the network itself, you know. And that, that's how I think of it, it, it as, you know, the DeFi 1.0. Okay. Um, you mentioned to me offline that the core concepts of DeFi 2.0 are similar to our current monetary system. Can you explain that? Yeah, so uh, I came from Hong Kong myself. You know, Hong Kong dollar is actually one of the stable coin, if you will, you know, which is the one- Pegged to the USD, yeah. Exactly, exactly. However, at the same time, you know, uh, the treasury backing the Hong Kong dollar uh, is not just one-to-one. -one. As a matter of fact, you know, it's every single Hong Kong dollar is backed by one single US dollars with an current exchange rate of one to about 7.78, you know. Uh, that means that it is over collateralized, you know. However, in the, tra in the open market, in the FX market, they're being traded at a price of actually only one Hong Kong dollar, meaning the value, even though it is being re realized at one Hong Kong dollar, it is over collateralized seven times, you know. Now, DeFi 2.0 actually is using that concept as well. So one of the most uh, famous network on DeFi, DeFi 2.0 is Olympus DAO with a token called OM. They borrow the same concept. They have a floor price of one uh, DAI. However, because they are over collateralized in such a way uh, that is uh, uh, basically you know, allowing people to value it differently than the intrinsic value, now they're able to basically allow the secondary market to trade the OM token many times more than you know, the original intrinsic value. And that's exactly what the DeFi, DeFi 2.0 is about. They are looking for ways to, find, to, to make people attract to the protocol such that you know, it can convert into what we call the total value locked. Uh, at the same time, you know, when, once people realize the fact that you know, this is something that everybody is using, they will start using the network. Okay, but what's the, what's the, what's the comparison to a stable coin then? Yeah, stable coin, for example, the likes of you know USDC yeah. backed every single dollar by another dollar. The Tether backed by cash equivalent commercial papers. They have a one-to-one -one backing, not over collateralized. Every single dollar will be backed by a issuance of, of one Tether, one USDC, and that's the difference you know between a protocol such as OM and the token versus that of a stable coin. Uh, it is namely you know that there's a floor price to OM. At the same time, you know, there is uh, also over collateralized value that can be realized by the secondary market. What does this DeFi 2.0, what does this development mean for investors or traders? Before we continue, help us clicking that YouTube like button and subscribe now to our channel. This shows the algorithm that you valued this information. And it helps us spread that message. Sharing is caring. And now, let's continue. Yeah, so one, uh, one thing that in the crypto side, a lot of folks look for is the yield. Uh, so what's happening is that DeFi 2.0, not only do they basically print extra tokens to reward the original stakers such that they don't get diluted from a market share perspective on the circling the supply, but at the same time, they also have something called a bonding. Bonding, what it means is that they will actually lend some of the liquidity pool tokens back to the protocol itself 
uh, and they will actually earn extra yield in the form of a token again. You know, I know it's a lot of you know concept to unpack. You know, and third but not least, you know, they can actually use some of the treasury locked up by the bond to buy back the tokens on the open market, such that the full price can be supported. So interestingly, you know, they kind of tie back to how the existing economy works. You know, uh, FX markets, monetary systems, you know, things like that. So it's mostly for yield generation, I guess. Absolutely, and that's one thing that's driving the market. You know, because I mean, as we know, you know. Let me let me ask you if this is a good idea, okay? I've heard, and I asked this to somebody else. I've heard that some engineers in the states, where um, Canada as well, they're they're actually asking for their salaries to be paid in USDC or USDT because they can stake it and earn a higher yield than their fiat currency. I don't know if you think that's a good idea. Well, uh, it's all about the risk, you know. At the end of the day, risk and reward. You know, if they're looking for the yield, which is very attractive, you know. They probably have to gauge, you know, whether or not the risk is justified, you know, such as the smart contract risk, you know, or any other counterparty risk, if you will, you know, from a uh, protocol perspective, you know, meaning if this project is going to survive, you know, why would there be counterparty risk? Oh, because you know the project in itself, you know, sometimes you know may not be able to survive, you know, from a funding perspective, you know, which is very real, you know, in the in the crypto world, you know. So I mean, what happens to a protocol after, let's say, for for example, the team is gone, you know, can be very interesting as well. You know, in a DAO structure, let's say I stake a project. And then the project issues more tokens. What happens to my share? Uh, actually, I mean, uh, you, you, your share will remain, right? I mean, if you if, if, you, if you continue to get rewarded, you know. Uh, but at the same time, you know, like I said before, you know, DAO in itself will continue to run. Uh, but uh, whether or not you know it is being maintained is another question altogether. Okay, so my share wouldn't get diluted by more issuance. Uh, n no, as long as you know you get rewarded for the staking part. But however, if you decide to not participate in the staking side, then it will be very similar to our current economy. But if I stake it, I can't withdraw my cash in a certain time period. That's right. So I mean, that's the another concept here, right? Uh, once you stake it, you don't lose control of it. You just simply cannot use it anymore. But whereas you know, if you think of it as a bond, you know, you actually lose title. They will be able to rehypothecate, you know, the uh, the assets, you know, and earn extra yield. How do I know I'm not going to get rug pulled? That's a, a, a tough question, you know, as always, you know, uh, but oftentimes, you know, it is actually uh, shown in the market price, you know, of token, where the, you, you rely on the, basically, the, uh, the community knowledge, if you will, you know, the crowd knowledge, if you will, you know, such that, you know, a lot of times you have to receive ima information that way. But however, smart contract is extremely transparent. I think there's also another way, you know, for people to, uh, a little bit more technical, to find out whether or not, you know, something is legit or not. Did you buy Squid Game Point? I did not, you know, I mean, uh, that, that, that's the key part, you know. <laughs> you did not buy or sell at the right time, you just didn't touch it at all. I did not touch it at all, you know, but if, I mean, in, on my team, you know, we got guys, you know, analyzing the contract, we understand it's a buy only, no selling token, <laughs> which is not the easiest thing to assault. That's important because uh, you look at some of these things, how do you evaluate if something is only buy only? Yeah, I mean, as a, as a uh, protocol, as a DeFi, DAO structure, you know, based, you know, uh, project ourselves, you know, we go through very rigid, you know, uh, you know, uh, protocol and procedures, right? One of the things that people look for is the fact that you know, it has to be audited. The the smart contract has to be audited. The team has to be vetted. You know, I think that's very important. All right. Okay. Finally, objectives of DeFi 2.0. What is it trying to accomplish besides providing better yield? Yeah. Uh, from a crypto's perspective, you know, a lot of times they're trying to prove the fact that you know they have a lot of token value locks value. Yeah. Uh, so TVL, as we as, as as we call it, you know. And at the end at the end of the day, you know, we are all trying to find uh, use cases for all the DeFi projects, protocols, things like that, you know. And one day, you know, I'm sure, you know, uh, a lot of the traditional economy will convert over in a DAO structure in a way such that everyone can participate. Perfect. Do you want to know one thing about crypto? I made over 3,000% in profit in a few weeks. Fact is, the traditional financial system, the traditional money system makes you poor, not rich. If you want to earn 500,000, 1 million dollar, you have to wait until you're 50, 60, 70 in the traditional financial system and you probably will still be broke and you will be old. This is not a sexy combination as you can imagine. But the question is, how can you start in crypto and make these profits? Where to invest? Where to start? My name is Gunnar and I'm from Germany as you can hear and things are a little bit different in Germany. More about that later on. The fact is, there are lots of different cryptocurrencies. It's a gigantic universe where beginners and professionals get easily lost. But there is light at the end of the tunnel. 
There are seven key steps you need to follow to become successful in this market. You have to know them. And if you fail one of them, it's literally impossible to succeed in this market. Just an example, one of the key points is your exchange. And one of the biggest are, for example, Binance and Coinbase. These are trusted and well-established exchanges. But, and this is a big but, you won't find the super profitable coins on those exchanges. The unknown super profitable coins that get gigantic profits are not traded on those kind of exchanges. They are traded on much smaller insider platforms that are barely known. And I can tell you what those super secret exchanges are and why they are so profitable. And another super important thing are the right information sources. The point is, the internet is gigantic. There are hundreds and hundreds of YouTube channels, blogs, pages and much, much more. And there are also market makers and influencers. For example, Elon Musk, he is not a crypto guy. But the moment he recommended Dogecoin, it went through the roof, to the moon, so to say. But why did he recommend it? Where did he hear it from? He didn't hear it from newspapers. And believe me, he is listening to someone. But you have to know who and you have to react before he is reacting. This is really, really important. And these are only two of the seven steps you have to follow in order to be successful in crypto. And if you want to know all of these steps in much more detail, and if you want to have a comprehensive checklist, here's what you should do. There is a link below this video. Click on this link and you will get the opportunity to subscribe to my channel. Click on the link and you will see a video where I explain the next steps. So see you soon. Click on the link now. I'll see you there.